elevated above what we saw in the financial crisis and Great Recession, and and, uh, we believe that we're in the mid-teens on an overall unemployment rate. Mortgage rates, I'm quoting from Bankrate.com. This is you guys. Mortgage rates reached a new all-time low this week. The benchmark 30-year fixed rate dipped to 3.44, a new record. You guys point out a 15-year fixed rate mortgage fell to 2.8 from 283. Um, if you can, yeah. that's just uh, those are those are those are once in a lifetime numbers, aren't they? Well, they are. Uh, you know, we've lived in an era of low interest rates uh, for a better part of a decade, and thank you for citing that. And that, that's part of our regular weekly uh, mortgage rate roundup that people can always check. And, and that's why we came into existence was to uh, provide insight on rates where previously essentially you had to go march to the bank in the, in the pre-internet era. Yeah. So, um, and the other part of that is, John, and this is probably as, as important a point as I would make that's uh, aligned with what we do a bank rate is that even with those averages, one can always do better than those averages because it is indeed an average, right? So, uh, so that is just sort of the yeah, midpoint yeah. Of, of the survey that we do. Uh, there are some rates are higher, some rates are lower, and, and uh, if you want to go shorter on duration, you can do that too. Yeah, three, four, four is the average. How about that? Uh, fascinating stuff, Mark. Thank you for your time today, Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief Senior Economic Analyst, Bankrate.com. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's twelve fourteen. Steve Bertrand in the WGN Radio Newsroom. Mostly sunny this afternoon. Could see more clouds this afternoon. Uh, Later, even a sprinkle, a high of 81 degrees. A nice day tomorrow, mostly sunny. Temperatures falling late in the afternoon, a high of 75. Right now at O'Hare, the latest temperature is 75, 76 at Midway, and 74 at the lakefront. Those numbers much more mild than what we're seeing on Wall Street. The Dow is down 1,400 points. The NASDAQ down 359, and the S&P 500 down 137. As for the roads, that big ramp closure on the Burn Interchange that was supposed to happen at the end of May will officially start tonight at 8. Traffic heading in on the Eisenhower will no longer be able to access the outbound side of the Kennedy. They'll be detoured onto Taylor Street on the far right side and then make a U-turn and enter back onto the outbound side of the Kennedy. The Taylor Street entrance ramp and bridge will be closed to all other traffic and used exclusively for the detour. And this will be in place for four months. Lauren Lapka, WGN Traffic Central. Hi, it's Lou Manfredini for the Gilkey Window Company. Did you know that Gilkey windows have been independently verified to be among the most energy efficient windows in the country? It's true. Gilkey windows eliminate the transmission of nearly all UV radiation. That makes a huge difference all year long, given Chicago's weather extremes. Right now, take $1,000 off five or more windows, $2,500 off 10 or more windows, and take $700 off patio and entry doors or no money down and no interest for 12 months. Gilkey offers several options to help you. They'll come to your home exercising safety measures, or you can visit their Chicago Ridge showroom open Monday through Saturday, or in Palatine even open Sundays 10 to 4. If new windows are on your list, give Gilkey a call now and schedule an appointment to get your home renovation underway. Call 1-888-3-G-I-L-K-E-Y or visit gilkey.com today. Choose vinyl or choose fiberglass. Just be sure to choose Gilkey. Your home is your castle, your refuge, your safe place. Quality of life begins at home. And family safety and security begin at home. Our job at 1-800-GOT-JUNK is to make junk disappear. And we're good at it. Your home will feel bigger. And cleaner. And you'll feel happier. We promise. Give us a call. Or go to our website. And your junk will magically disappear as our truck drives past your home. Well, almost. We'll be in and out before you can blink. And our gloved professionals touch nothing except the things you want to disappear. You can count on 1-800-GOT-JUNK to keep you safe. And you can count on 1-800-GOT-JUNK to not disrupt your household. These are highly trained professionals whose only desire is to give you more space to live and laugh and love and breathe. Big, clean, wide open spaces. 1-800-GOT-JUNK or visit 1-800-GOT-JUNK.COM Hi, it's Bob Surratt. I didn't want a 9-to-5 job, so I'm here 5-to-9. See you mornings, Monday through Friday. Your town, your sound, your very own WG. For some reason, that little jingle sing there reminds me that Sundays at 9 o'clock, we're stepping 
away from the news and talk for two whole hours and playing some of the classic songs from the Great American Songbook. The same way we do Sinatra on Sunday morning starting at 6.30, we'll wrap up your weekend with songs from Nat King Cole and Tony Bennett and Ella Fitzgerald and Etta James, and the list just goes on. So if you think hearing some of those great American songs and singers blasting through your AM radio is going to be fun again in a year where there's no live music in Chicago, I think you'll enjoy what you're going to hear. Sunday nights at 9. Where are you Sunday nights at 9? But you're getting ready for bed. Maybe you're kind of shuffling around the kitchen or the den or the bedroom. Just turn on the radio. Use your smart speaker. 9 to 11. Hopefully you've got us on anyway, but if you don't, turn us back on Sunday nights at 9. Hey, there's Chicago in there real. Watch Dan Ponce, Lauren Jiggetts, Larry Potash, and Robin Baumgarten. Get real in the morning with WGN-TV Morning News Team. That's weekdays from 4 to 10. Ian Schur back on WGN Radio once again from CNET where he is an editor at large. Hi, Ian. Welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? Really good. A lot of ground to plow. You ready to roll? As much as I can. Well, so, you know, we were just talking before the news about how seismic the shift throughout all aspects of our culture seems to be post-George Floyd. I'm reading now that Yelp will add a new tool to search for black-owned businesses. Perhaps this is tied to that, maybe not. Can you expand a little on that? It's absolutely tied to that. So over the last couple of weeks, Yelp has reported seeing a 25x increase in the frequency of searches for black-owned businesses. And they realize that that is a feature they don't really have. Uh, you know, if people want to be able to help specific businesses, specifically around politically charged times such as these, why not help them? And uh, so there's this tool they've created where you can self-identify as a black-owned business so it's kind of on the honor system here. Uh, but, you know, the people who are able to claim their business listing on Yelp, you then self-identify, and then people who want to search for you, they'll be able to do that. And I, I'm really curious to see where it goes. Uh, Yelp already has started a collection of black-owned businesses. We have a list to it on CNET, of course. And I'm curious to see whether or not they're going to start expanding this over time. Uh, for example, here in Washington, D.C., where I am, there's a lot of uh, talk about minority and women-owned businesses so I'm curious to see if they're going to start pushing in that, you know, in a broader direction as well. But certainly during these times, there's a lot of talk about helping the black community and supporting them extra amounts than we, uh, than we normally do. And this is a very interesting way to be able to do that. Amazon has a Black Lives Matter banner on their website. How's that working out for them? Um, I think that it's working out for them the same it's working out for a lot of companies. You know, th this has been rather extraordinary time seeing a bunch of companies come out and, and really just decide that politics is not what they're going to debate anymore. They're going to take a stand on what they argue is a human rights issue. And by supporting Black Lives Matter, you see that Amazon has it as a big banner on their website. And um, it, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, has gotten a number of angry emails. And instead of just pushing delete like a lot of us do, he decided instead to put some of them on Instagram and to actually expose these people without their names, but just simply showing what they wrote. And some of them are really pretty terrible. We have a list, of, you know, link to them on Cena if you want to read them. But I think it's uh, most telling that at the bottom of them, when uh, Bezos reads it and this person says, I'm never going to order from Amazon again, uh, Bezos' response is, Dave, you're the kind of customer I'm happy to lose. So it's, it's that kind of thing, I think, is these companies are really willing to push hard on these issues now. What's happening over at Facebook then? Well, Facebook is going through its own kind of issues. So, you know, every one of the major tech companies at this point has has donated a certain amount of money to racial issues organizations. They've pledged to make things better, even though most of Silicon Valley is run by white men, and they have huge diversity issues throughout all of their companies. But at, at, at Facebook in particular, there's an extra problem, which is that it, social media companies have kind of become this central focal point of the 2020 election, and really a lot of frustration over the tweets and messages that Donald Trump, the president, puts out. 
Um, you may remember, most notably, in the last couple of weeks, President Trump put out a tweet that said, if the looting shoots, the shooting start, shoot starts, or sorry, the looting starts, the shooting starts, which was uh, a reference to uh, supporting uh, police um, beating protesters and, and looters. And one of the things that I think was really interesting is that Twitter decided to pull that tweet down and uh, hide it behind a little message saying this violates our rules. If you want to read it, you can click to read through, but we're not going to have this easily accessible on our website. Facebook has decided not to do that, and Mark Zuckerberg's getting a ton of pushback from his employees, and now even some of the, uh, pro the researchers that he helps to fund through his uh, philanthropic organization, they have started speaking up, which is very unusual as well. We've talked about that scenario, maybe with you, maybe with some of our other guests. And the president said he wasn't advocating for shooting. He was describing what happens when looting starts. And it appeared as though Facebook bought that. But talk to me a little bit about what's happening. Um, I'm not sure if this is Facebook or on all social media platforms. The, the Trump team came up with an ad or a video and that's getting pulled from sites as well. And yet it references George Floyd and is trying to embrace peace and inclusivity. What went wrong? Yeah, the biggest problem was that uh, this is something that the Trump uh, team has run across many times, is that they actually violated a copyright. Uh, so they used music that they didn't have the right to use. Uh, if you look through history, there's actually a number of times politicians on both sides have gotten criticism from musicians for using their music without asking for permission, uh, usually during campaign rallies. But with uh, President Trump in particular, he's tweeted out and retweeted a lot of videos that the White House or his uh, supporters create that use music from, for example, the, uh, the Batman series uh, by Christopher Nolan, or they use uh, an image that looks very much like it came from Game of Thrones. And in both cases, there was a push over, well, wait a minute, are you stealing someone else's intellectual property to make a political statement? And so it was a very standard issue. Uh, these companies, uh, all of the social media companies, have a system for if the copyright order uh, holder wants that thing brought down. They are allowed to fill out a form. It's perfectly by the law, and they can pull it down. And that's what's happened in this case. It happens thousands of times a day. And uh, President Trump could have easily avoided it by not violating that copyright. How do you do that? Do you then call the artist and say, hey, we want to use your song. Is that okay? Or we want to use a clip from your movie or whatever? Yeah. So, um, you know, as uh, personally, as someone in the media, I've learned uh, how this stuff works. And it's very similar to how it is for you guys in radio. Uh, you know, there's a lot of systems you can pay for that allow you to have kind of broad access to a whole library of music uh, to use as you want to for commercial purposes. And that is what happens there. When it comes to some music that you want to use that isn't in those libraries, yes, then you have to go to the rights holder and say, hey, can I have the right to use this thing? They'll say, yes or no. That's their choice. It's their music. And if they say yes, they may say, well, give me some money and I'll allow you to do it. And uh, that's typically how this stuff works out. Ian Scherz on a line, editor at large, CNET.com. Talk to me about Apple and their, has Apple generated an app that is supposed to help me diagnose whether or not I have COVID-19? Yeah, they actually generated it a long time ago. So uh, what they did is they created this on their website. And all of them seem to have some version of this that they worked with the CDC on early on to help people identify whether they have COVID-19. And, uh, in fact, the, uh, if you go to the CDC's website and you try that thing, they have a system over there that was built with Microsoft. So Apple's thing has a new feature that they added on since they first launched this thing back in March, I think it was, where now you can actually put in information like your age, uh, the, your pre-existing health conditions, your potential exposure risks, and the state you live in. And Apple says that what they will do is that they will completely anonymize all that information and then send it to the CDC to help them to identify where there may be flare-ups in your area or if there are certain 
certain people with certain health conditions who are more likely to get it. it it's kind of, it underscores to me how little we actually know about yeah. the coronavirus, even though we've been studying it and we've sequenced its genome and all of this stuff. There's a lot we don't know. And I think what's interesting is the tech industry, at least in some ways, is trying to step up and help us with uh, figuring it out. Well, if I give Apple that information, what do they give me? Do they tell me if I have the virus or not? So the, what they will do if you are someone who potentially has it is that they will recommend that you social distance, obviously, and that you uh, isolate yourself, and they will recommend you go to a doctor. And that's actually what happened with me when I was uh, I got sick, and I went through the CDC's tool, so I used the Microsoft thing, and that's exactly what it told me. It said, you know, call your doctor, call a, a, a urgent care clinic, you should go in and get tested, and that's exactly what happened. I'm sorry, do you care to share with us the results of that? Yeah, so it's actually really frustrating. Uh, so I was isolated for two weeks away from my family in our basement, mm. and uh, I had all the classic symptoms. They, they clinically diagnosed me at the doctor's office, and it took two weeks for my, for my uh, test to come back. And when it did, the, the nurse got on the phone with me, and she said, okay, I want to start by telling you that 40% of the tests are wrong so you can't trust if it says you're negative and I'm like okay and she said you came back negative but we think you were still positive so you want you don't want to act like you had it and think that you're safe but you likely did stay in the basement <laughs> how long ago in the basement. it appears as though the tests are better now and quicker now how long ago did all of that happen to you it happened to me in uh, in late April, and uh, for the most part, as I understand it, the tests are quicker, but they are not more accurate still. It depends on which test you get. There's a bunch of different ones. And then, I don't know if you're aware, this is just my own research, the antibody tests, there's not a single one that the FDA has cleared yet. So people can go get antibody tests, but they're not actually reliable, which is underscores, I think, back to what our original point here was, you know, all of these companies are trying to help the CDC uh, uh, figure out a lot of the details of this virus because we really just haven't gotten our arms around it yet. Yeah, and I want you to answer this question next time we visit. We got a new iPad at my house, and as I'm filling the, the as, as I'm you know enabling it and adding apps, a lot of times questions pop up, and it says this app wants access to your personal information. You know, right. and, I, and they promise that nothing bad's going to happen, but it'll help. <laughs> It'll help the developers, and it's good to know yeah. where you are, if it's shopping or weather or whatever. And I'm yeah. inclined to say, yes, you can use my information. Yes or no? Am I making a mistake there? It depends on the app you're using. I mean, if you can trust that company, then absolutely, if you're comfortable with it, you should. Okay. But there are instances where uh, unscrupulous companies who are kind of fly-by-night or run right. by company people you can't trust, where they do misuse that information, and that's where it's problematic. That was a yes or no question, Ian. <laughs> Sorry, it's no, no, never no, no. easy, right? <laughs> next, n next time you and I are going to talk more about that, okay? Absolutely. Ian, sure. Editor at large, more about that, okay? Absolutely. Ian, sure. Editor at large, CNET.com. It's 1230. It is currently 75 degrees at O'Hare. Good afternoon at 1230. I'm Steve Bertrand. This news sponsored by WGN America. Steve Mnuchin says there will not be another shutdown amid big drops on Wall Street today. First, a look at traffic. Here's Lauren Lapka. Not too much to report on when it comes to the major roadways. Eden's looks good. Traffic is a bit heavy inbound on the Kennedy around Division. It's 23 minutes from O'Hare. Don't forget that ramp closure on the Jane Byrne interchange that will take place tonight starting at 8 and that will last until the fall, but there will be a detour in place. Eisenhower, Stevenson, Dan Ryan all looking good. I-55 North is stop and go through the one-lane construction zone near Lorenzo and Blodgett, and I-8094 East is a bit slow between Martin Luther King Drive and Clay Street because of construction. Lauren Lapka, W. Traffic Central. The forecast from the Permaseal Weather Center, mostly sunny today. Could see a sprinkle later as the clouds start to build. A high of 81 degrees, 61 the low tonight as skies clear. And then mostly sunny tomorrow, breezy temperatures falling late in the afternoon. But before that, a high of 75. That's where we are right now at uh, O'Hare and the lakefront. It's 76 degrees at Midway Airport. Another one and a half million Americans filed new unemployment claims last week. In Illinois, there were about 45,000 residents who filed. That's down a bit from the week before. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin says the state 
won't, or the nation rather, won't lock down again. He said on NBC, they learned a lot during the lockdowns that began in March. He said there was a lot of damage done by states shutting down for weeks that went beyond the economic damage. And keep the dice in their case, at least for a while longer. The Illinois Gaming Commission met today for the first time in four months, but they did not set a date for reopening the state's casinos. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 1,400 points. It actually was down more than 1,500 at one point. The Nasdaq down 371, and the S&P 500 down 144. I'm Steve Bertrand on Chicago's very own 720 WGN. Economic uncertainty can make you feel like your financial well-being is out of your hands. Take back control with 15 times the usual FDIC protection. Wintrust understands the worry an uncertain market can cause and is prepared to provide peace of mind. With a Wintrust MaxSafe account, you can insure your deposits up to $3.75 million. How do they do it? By spreading funds across their 15 separate community bank charters. That's one account with 15 times the coverage. Learn more at Wintrust.com slash MaxSafe. Member FDIC. Napa know how. Father's Day knickknacks. That funny mug. Ironic tie. Or worse, IOU coupon books. It's time to get yourself something you want, Dad. Like a Craftsman half-inch corded impact wrench for $99.99. It's the perfect gift to give to yourself. And while you're here, don't forget to shop all our great deals on Craftsman tools. Quality parts, helpful people. That's Napa Know How. Napa Know How. At participating Napa Auto Parts stores while supplies last. Offer ends 63020. 1234, and you are listening to the Wind Trust Business Lunch on WGN Radio. Pete Zimmerman is our producer. Steve Bertrand has another Wind Trust Business Minute for you in moments, and we'll continue to follow the markets as they continue to move down steadily right now on the Dow off about 1,400 points. We've been taking some time on the Wind Trust Business Lunch since, say, COVID 19 hit to talk to local businesses about how they are doing these days. Today we go out to Countryside. The president and CEO of NICO is Bob Stahersky. Bob, you're on WGN Radio. How are you today? Hi, John. How are you today? Really good. You guys are out in uh, Countryside, right? Yes, we are. And you guys are in the cleaning, the chemical business. Is that right? Right. We're in the manufacturing and packaging of specialty chemicals for primarily institutional and industrial use. So who would be a customer for you guys? Um, janitorial distributors, uh, large food service distributors, um, uh, um, maintenance and repair operation distributors, large companies, um, and ending for uh for those customers in, in that space are you actually mixing the chemicals here in illinois or are you wholesaling the product in no we we have formulations and uh we buy raw materials we blend we custom blend those materials and then package them to spec for our customers and we also do it under our own nyco brands as well how many folks you all employ out there um we're a little bit under 100 people right now how's it going it's pretty busy it's like trying to sell ice cream on the beach in the summertime pretty easy right now with the heightened awareness for for cleaning and safety cleaning for health and disinfecting right now i know some people that are in these allied fields but their problem is that the restaurants aren't buying it because the restaurants aren't open Uh, all of your potential customers are still doing business huh we are. I mean, we do business nationally uh, as well, and so some of our customers in Illinois, of course, you know, as, as we've just opened up a new phase, uh, we have outside dining and restaurants are operating at about 25% capacity, but on a national basis with other states open, we've seen some of that business come back, and, uh, uh, you know, it continues to come back. The pipeline was relatively full with products when, when COVID-19 uh, broke, but we have seen a a significant increase in the amount of disinfectant and sanitizing products, of course. What do you say to the fact that I still can't find enough of that for, you know, just domestic use? Well, it, it is a challenge. I was in a, uh, a couple of big box retailers this weekend looking, and I did find some disinfectants on the shelf that that are, you know, COVID approved, that, that have uh, uh, label claims that would make them safe and effective to use uh, at home or, or in a business. But there are allocations. A lot of the, the products that we manufacture are made with 
uh, raw materials called quaternary ammonium compounds. And there are basically three manufacturers of quaternary ammonium compounds in the U.S. And uh, all of them have folks like ourselves on allocation right now. But we've been working through it, and we've been able to keep a, a pretty steady and significant stream. I, I think there's also been a lot of hoarding in the marketplace, yeah, which yeah. has eaten up a lot of the supply as well. Allocated because they want to reserve the, the, the supplies, the, the raw materials for the medical industry, for the medical side? There has been some that uh, initially, like, for instance, in disinfecting wipes, most of the, the product that was manufactured was uh, selected to go into health care instead of other marketplaces. Yeah. So, about, so that um, made sense. Your that products, was a good point. Can I buy some of your stuff? I mean, give me the good stuff. If, if I'm still <laughs> concerned about surfaces around my home, although I do think that people's interest in Safeguarding themselves has shifted more from surfaces to uh, the, the aeration of the disease. But is, is there a product that you sell that would help me de-COVID my home? Um, there is. We, we manufacture a ready-to-use product called Santa Spritz that is the EPA-registered product in, in all 50 states in, in the U.S., and that, that product is effective against COVID-19 when used as directed. And, and that's the key is that the, the most important thing people can do is read the label and follow the label directions uh, to make sure that you use the product properly. Otherwise, all you potentially can do is create cross-contamination instead of cleaning. You'll contaminate other surfaces. I've heard that, that if you don't do these things properly, you just push it around. It's there and now it's everywhere because you just wiped it around and didn't properly use the product or wait after you did. That's called Santa Spritz. Where do I buy that? Is it online or is it in stores? Uh, 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 Santa Spritz is available online. It's available. We, uh, NICO has some online retail uh, that we have. We also have some big box stores that, that carry Santa Spritz in the hardware segment as well. So it's been, it's, it's been in significant production and, and with significant demand as of lately. We're talking to Bob Stahersky. Countryside, the chief executive officer of NICO Products. So I guess if I go to NICOproducts.com, is that where I'll find this stuff, Bob? Yes, you will. Yes, John, you will. Are uh, you guys working overtime over there? Are you able to keep up? Uh, we're working hard. Our team is, is working very hard. Uh, we've run extended shifts. We run two extended shifts per day. And uh, we've been working on the weekend as well. And we've got an incredible team of people that are super dedicated. And, uh, and they know that, that every gallon that they make is potentially helping someone stay healthy. So a uh, fantastic team of people. I keep up the good work, Bob. Um, I'm telling you, I think you've just sold a couple of gallons of Santa Spritz here today. But uh, we wish you all the best out there. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Bob Stahersky over at NICO Products, N-Y-C-O, NICOproducts.com. Coming up on 1241, time for the Trust Business Lunch. Wind the clock. It's time for the Trust Business Minute, your daily roundup of Chicago area business news. Ford is expanding in Chicago. It signed a lease for a big industrial building near its southeast side assembly plant. Crane says Ford plans to use the building for pre-assembly work of components that will then be delivered to the plant on Torrance Avenue. New local startup helping homeowners lower their property taxes just raised its first round of funding. Tax proper raised $2 million. Chicago Inno says it's built a system to easily appeal your property taxes. And while we're talking money, a Chicago data analytics startup just raised a new round of funding. Ocean has raised $15 million. They're building a database and analytics software program to help companies better understand the massive amounts of data they're collecting. That's the Trust Business Minute. I'm Steve Bertrand. Lauren Lapka's in Traffic Central. Yeah, there's a crash now in Grays Lake that's shut down Route 83 between Washington and Lake Street. And on the south side, bridge work over the Chicago River has the northbound side of Loomis closed off between Eleanor and Surmac. The southbound side has been closed, but now has one lane open. The project should finish in the fall. 
Lauren Lapka, WGN Traffic Central. Ray to ask Steve Bertrand, what are you seeing on the boards? Well, the latest numbers on Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is currently trading down by about, uh, I'm losing it here on my board, it was down more than 1,500 points at its worst, now down 1,481. The S&P 500 down th- uh, 147, and the NASDAQ down 383. There's an announcement coming from City Hall today. Mayor Lightfoot has a news conference along with the police superintendent Brown and Congressman Bobby Rush will be there too uh, talking about some policing issues and uh, we'll carry that. We expect it to begin around one o'clock. It's 1242 on WGN Radio. Orion Samuelson, what are you looking at? Well, if people are looking for a quieter market, take a look at the agricultural markets. We're not seeing the kind of movement there as we are on Wall Street. At the moment, the July wheat contract is down three and a quarter cents a bushel. And that puts it at uh, 502 and a half a bushel. July corn up three and a quarter cents putting it at uh, $3.29 and a half cents a bushel. July soybeans are trading up eight and three quarter cents. That puts it at $8.66 and a quarter cents. And in livestock futures at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange today, the uh, June lean hog contract is still slightly higher. It's up about seven cents a Hundredweight. The uh, June live cattle contract is trading up 30 cents a hundredweight. And the feeder cattle contract for August is trading down 77 cents a hundredweight. But now hear this because I've been getting so many emails. I received this yesterday afternoon. Planning for the Sandwich Fair is still underway. The fair has not been canceled at this time. Sandwich Association Fair Board will be making a final decision on the future of this year's fair, they hope, by mid-July. The board is hoping the state of Illinois health guidelines evolve regarding large events and will provide a path to allow events like the Sandwich Fair in September sometime over the next month. The board has been and will be following the state and local health guidelines for the fair and will and all rental events on the fairgrounds. If there does not appear to be a path to having the event by mid-July, that will cause the fair and all rental events to be canceled for this year. So that's the latest. The Sandwich Fair is still planned for September, but that could all change depending on what happens with the COVID-19 situation. And uh, the other note that we make is June Dairy Month. Dairy on the uh, farm breakfast on the dairy farms in Wisconsin. They normally hold over 60 of those on dairy farms, but uh, they'll so far, according to John Onkin, our dairy friend in Wisconsin, Only one is still on the schedule. So uh, you'll have to wait till next year to go to a dairy farm, although I'm sure a dairy farmer would like to show off what he's got, but because of the COVID-19 situation, probably won't happen. And we'll try to keep you posted on the county fair and state fair cancellations. One other event, the Illinois FFA Association holding its annual convention in Springfield but not in front of a room full of blue-jacketed FFA members. (laughs) They're doing it virtually, and they're winding up today with the uh, officer election, and uh, we'll try to summarize what they have done this week because this is the first-ever virtual state convention the Illinois FFA has held. We were singing their praises earlier on the show and talking about how adaptable that organization has been over the years, and there's more evidence of that. The Sandwich County Fair, Orion, isn't that like the oldest or largest county fair in America? Well, it's certainly, in America, yeah, it would be close uh, because of the attendance they get and because of their proximity to Chicago. They have a large city audience that looks forward to the Sandwich Fair every year. Uh, I'm one of them. And uh, so uh, we're going to wait to see, but uh, they'll wait until they get final guidelines from the state on the health when you put a lot of people together because they do attract a lot of people 
comes right after the uh, Labor Day weekend in September. So let's hope things have cleared up a little bit by then. Orion, I was a junior broadcaster at WSPY in Plano, Illinois. I lived in Sandwich, and my first job was there. And one of my responsibilities was to do play-by-play of the tractor pull. Right. <laughs> and, there's, and there's not a lot to, to, to play by when you're doing a play-by-play of a tractor pull, but it really is a great fair. It really it, is well done. Yeah, and uh, the thing I love about it is its setting because it's loaded with shade trees, yeah. and it's like an 1800 county fair yeah. would be that I could imagine. So, yeah, we'll keep people posted on that because I'm getting a lot of emails already saying, what about the sandwich fair? Thanks, so. That's okay. Orion Samuelson. We'll keep you posted on that. You know Orion is paying attention to it. Amy Guth is paying attention to a number of businesses, including what's up with Grubhub and how you get your food next. If you've got knee pain, go to the Joint Relief Institute. Even now, the Joint Relief Institute is seeing patients regularly. This quick, pain-free, non-surgical procedure is not only allowed, it's always been something to consider before or instead of knee replacement. So what do you know? Maybe you could go for that socially distanced walk right now because here's what they do at the Joint Relief Institute. With digital imaging, they see where your knee has deteriorated. They put a lubricant into that precise spot. They're expert at this, you know. It's all they do. And when you walk in, you'll be greeted by... Oh, you're going to walk out feeling better. But first, you got to walk in. And again, they are seeing patients. Online, find them at jointreliefinstitute.com. In person, they're in Oak Brook and Orland Park. On the phone, same phone number for both locations, 708-888-0000, 708-888-0000, as in zero pain. Hi, this is Lou Manfredini, and I have John Rogers on the line, the president of Rogers Roofing, your trusted roofing contractor for over 50 years. John, the health and safety of homeowners and your employees is always your top top priority. What is Rogers Roofing doing during these challenging times? Lou, like most of us, we're monitoring the health concerns facing our communities. We've taken numerous actions to do our part in helping limit the spread of the virus while still providing homeowners the exceptional products and services they've come to expect. We are essential and we are working. So if someone has damage or is in need of a new roof or new siding, is this a good time to call Rogers Roofing? Absolutely. We'll provide you a virtual estimate in the comfort of your own home. And our production team is following the enhanced health precaution guidelines from the CDC and practice social distancing. Plus, we're providing our very best pricing and financing ever. I want to help our customers during these trying times and keep our employees working. Call Rogers Roofing for a free virtual estimate. 800 New Roof. That's 800 New roof or log on to rogersroofing.com. Attention business owners. With the coronavirus and so many other contaminants polluting our air, the challenges of staying healthy and productive can feel overwhelming. Millhouse Engineering and Construction solves problems that improve communities everywhere. They use a special fog sanitization to effectively sanitize against the coronavirus. Maximize the productivity of your staff with peace of mind. You'll know you've taken precautions to provide a healthy work environment. Millhouse's sanitization fogging is the same process recently adopted by the major your airlines. It filters the air with a three-stage HEPA filtration system and uses a hospital-grade EPA-registered solution for fogging. Unlike other processes, their solution doesn't use bleach or leave a toxic residue. Their sanitizing fog combats contaminants in the air and on hard, soft, and porous surfaces. To sanitize the air against coronavirus and other contaminants in your office, call Millhouse Engineering right now for a consultation at 855-621-0001. That's 855-621-0001 or millhouseinc.com. Is COVID-19 causing concerns about getting medical care when you need it? With telehealth, it's easy to safely connect with experts at North Shore University Health System. Telehealth and e-visits offer care online or on the phone without leaving home. From primary care to consulting with a specialist for serious issues. And for in-person visits, we're practicing the latest safety protocols. Get the care you need now at North Shore, online, on the phone, or in person. Visit northshore.org slash telehealth. 1251, the Wing Trust Business Lunch. Maybe not as much time as we normally have a press conference from the city about police accountability coming your way at 1 o'clock. Amy Guth watches the business scene for us on WGN. Amy, I could have told you this. We are all sleeping worse due to COVID-19 study shows. 
I know. That was one of those stories. It was like, and the sky is blue and water is wet. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, it's interesting, though, because there's a nuance to it that, that I thought was really fascinating about the study. In fact, once more people were working from home, our sleep duration improved because it allowed us to kind of reset to our own biological rhythm. If you're a night owl or a morning person, you probably had a little more leeway to do that because you didn't have to necessarily punch a clock or be at your desk at a certain time. Right. So in one hand, it benefited us, but the social impact of that, and that is the stress, the anxiety, the uncertainty that in the study is referred to as social jet lag, which, you know, maybe like a social hangover kind of feeling where you're just kind of inundated with a lot of information, a lot of it's very scary or stressful. That part is the thing that's really messing with our sleep cycle. So we're not getting, we're sleeping maybe a little bit more, but we're not getting as deep or as quality of sleep as perhaps we were pre-COVID. But again, the sky is blue, water is wet. We could have probably guess that one. I, I'm happy to hear that other people though are reporting on what a lot of us individually are experiencing. And I've also heard this kind of information tagged to the dreams which we have, which seem to be more vivid. And on one of our shows, it might have been Bob Surratt's show, the analyst said, you're not dreaming more vividly, but you're waking up so much, you're having better recalls of the dreams, which are always fairly vivid. But doesn't it seem like your dreams are like off the chain these days? Absolutely. And I'm a really vivid dreamer anyway, and sometimes I'm like, wake up from these long, complicated dreams. But yeah, lately I'm like, whoa, the last couple of months they've been exhausting. I gotta, I have a nap. I need a nap once yeah, I wake up. Yeah, I hate dream. that. You wake up and go, that wasn't any fun. Grubhub <laughs> is going to be sold and maybe the economy is always now going to embrace food delivery. This is a very profitable arena, isn't it? Yeah, this is a really big story. This became there was speculation that this was going to happen, but it became official yesterday. And so Grubhub has been acquired by a company called um, Jesse Takeout, cute name. But it, that company itself is the result of a merger of Takeout.com and Just Eat, and that was a nearly eight billion dollar merger about a year ish ago, something like that. So um, they have now. So they're going to be based in Amsterdam. That's going to be the global headquarters, and then the North American headquarters will be right here in Chicago. So it's really good news for Chicago because that we've already got that big Grubhub workforce here, um, several thousand people already. It's really just going to strengthen that. It is an interesting moment, though, to kind of step back and say, what is the bigger picture here with food delivery? Have we really changed that significantly in such a short period of time? The bet on this was yes. Leading up to this, there was a lot of speculation that Uber was going to be the person to acquire the, or the company to acquire them. And what it really came down to, there was a lot of antitrust issues. There was a lot of questions. There was and and. The word on the street, anyway, is that um, the Uber deal was a little bit less money. It was about $5 less per share, according to sources familiar with it. So this is who went out, and Justy Takeaway, at, interestingly, the CEO of Justy Takeaway started around the same time as Matt Maloney. Career moves that, that did this, uh, the CEO, Jits Gruen, in, in Amsterdam, he was in his dorm. So it's almost like the Zuckerberg kind of story when he started that. So I think they regard each other as peers, very optimistic statements from them both going in here. But it's a, you know, over $7 billion acquisition. That's really, really huge. It's an all-stock deal. And, uh, of course, that's still got to be voted in by, by shareholders and all that. But, but it's essentially official as of, as of this week. What can you tell me about this uh, Southeast Side factory? It seems like anybody that owns commercial real estate's taking it on the chin these days. What's going on with this Ford plant? Yeah, Ford Motor Company has signed a lease to expand. Uh, They have a plant there. It's really close to their their South Torrance Avenue plant, about a mile and a half away. This is going to be a a facility doing pre-assembly work is what they're describing it. And this is a uh, part of North Point Development, which already said they're pledging $164 million to develop this area that used to be the Republic Steel Factory for kind of a landmark there. And so this is a 359,000-square-foot building. So this is a really kind of a, a double-down for Ford, which they said they would do. They, they said, we will invest in Chicago, and here they are doing it. Of course, you know, they, they were closed down, as many automakers were, for a couple of months, reopened, and here locally, shut down again two days later after a yeah. couple of workers were, were testing positive for coronavirus. So they're back up online. 
they feel it's going to be just a matter of weeks, not months, for them to get everything back online and moving forward. But a lot of investment from Ford on the southeast side. It's good to hear. Good to hear you, too. We're going to run now, Amy. We've got that press conference coming up. Let's talk again soon. Thanks, John. Amy Guth reports on the business scene on the Wind Trust Business Lunch. There's drama in the mountains. A man solves a riddle and finds a long-lost million-dollar treasure in the Rocky Mountains. But a Rogers Park woman says, hang on, it's mine. Plus stories from the cancel culture. Does a business's politics or values matter to you when you shop there? All that and more. I'm Anna DeVlantis at 1 o'clock. WGN. Only one person at a time can enjoy a recliner. That's not fair. But expand that easy chair into the Chloe reclining sofa from Penny Mustard and your whole family can enjoy it at the same time. Now that's more like it. The Chloe takes the function and relaxation of a recliner and turns it all the way up to 11. It's the ultimate optionizable recliner sofa. With options to infinity. Along with tufted lumbar sections and unsmooshable high density foam seats. It comes in a variety of fabric and leather options too. Including kid and pet friendly fabrics. Speaking of pets, people love the Chloe's solid chase leg extension, so pets can cuddle at their owner's feet. I love it when my pet Harvey gets cozy in my lap. Is Harvey your dog? No, he's my emotional support sloth. You have a sloth? Yeah, I just wish he wasn't so rambunctious. The Chloe reclining sofa, starting at just thirteen seventy at Penny Mustard. Six locations throughout Chicagoland. PennyMustard.com. Better versions of what people want. Penny Mustard. Things are looking up Chicagoland. Lindemann Chimney Heating and Cooling represents the safest, best trained staff in the industry. For 50 years, they've been making beautiful homes like yours safe and sound. Book at cleanfireplace.com. Hello folks, Orion here again, and if you're in the market for a new Subaru, then Gary Lang Subaru is the name I trust. Right now, experience their touchless car buying system at garylangsubaru.com. Simply select your favorite Subaru model from their vast and Inventory, Legacy, Impreza, Forester, Outback, Crosstrek, or Ascent. Secure your financing, get an instant trade offer, and your car will be delivered to your door. Or you can schedule an appointment in their sanitized showroom. Folks, visit Gary Lang Subaru, just minutes away from anywhere on Route 31 between McHenry and Crystal Lake, or Complete your entire purchase online at GaryLangSubaru.com. You can't afford to buy or lease a new Subaru anywhere else. And remember, if it doesn't say Gary Lang on the back, you probably paid too much. Our world has changed. When you leave home, face coverings are the new normal. But the kind you use really matters, and not all offer the same protection. Boomer Naturals has a covering with three layers of ultra-soft, breathable cloth infused with nano-silver technology, available in adult and children's sizes. And Boomer Naturals cloth is made for use up to 30 days when hand-washed between uses. Order now at BoomerNaturals.com, use code BOB20 at checkout, and save 20 20%. Free shipping on any orders over $50. Serving the great Midwest from Chicago, this is WGN at AM 720 on your radio and on smart devices anywhere just by saying play WGN radio on TuneIn. WGN Chicago on Nexstar Media Group Station. It is 75 degrees at 1 o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Bertrand. This news sponsored by Lindemann Chimney and Cooling. No date yet for Chicago casinos on Wall Street. A deep dive in the markets. First, a look at traffic in Traffic Central. Lauren Lapka. And this traffic report is sponsored by Plumbers911.com. When you call Plumbers911, you're guaranteed to have plumbing professionals such as Sherman Mechanical fix your plumbing problem right the first time. Call Plumbers911 24-7 at 833-PLUM-911. An accident on I-8094 West is blocking the left lane at Torrance. Traffic is heavy on the eastbound side as well between I-65 and Central. Also seeing a crash eastbound on Reagan Memorial at Veterans Memorial. No issues on the Edens or Kennedy. Inbound Eisenhower stop and go from Ashland. Stevenson looking good. I-55 North is congested between Lorenzo and Blodgett because of road work. Otherwise, up on Dan Ryan, it's slow from Garfield. It's 18 minutes out to 95th. Lauren Lapka, WGN Traffic Central. The forecast from the WGN Chicago Weather Center, meteorologist Mike Jansen. A little late day cloud cover could lead to a sprinkle, but for the most part, plenty of sunshine, breezy westerly winds gusting up to 30 miles per hour and highs this afternoon in the upper 70s to lower 80s. 
Clearing our skies tonight, temperatures drop into the lower 60s and a good dose of sunshine for our Friday. Highs in the mid 70s inland, upper 60s at the lake, but a backdoor cold front leads to breezy north northeast winds late in the day. Temperatures going to be dropping as well, and that leads to a cooler Saturday. Despite mostly sunny skies, highs inland only reach the upper 60s and near 70. We stay in the lower 60s at the lakefront. Sunday, mostly sunny afternoon, highs in the lower 70s, mid 60s lakeside. Then mostly sunny on Monday. We make it more seasonable around here. Highs in the upper 70s inland, closer to 70 by the lake. Tuesday, mostly sunny in the morning hours, partly cloudy in the afternoon, maybe even a stray shower. Highs in the mid 80s inland, upper 70s lakeside. From the WGN Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Mike Chance. Checking the current conditions right now at O'Hare Airport. It is 75 degrees, 76 at Midway, 75 at Chicago's Lakefront. We're standing by for a news conference from Mayor Lightfoot, Police Superintendent Brown, and Congressman Bobby Rush today. They'll be talking about policing issues. The congressman is introducing a bill to hold police chiefs accountable for so-called bad apples in their departments. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle announced a $40 million grant today for contract tracing in the county. The program will help us continue to mitigate the pandemic by identifying new cases quickly and helping residents who've been exposed to someone carrying the disease. The grant will allow Cook County to hire contract tracers from neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and have experienced systemic racism. The Illinois Gaming Commission held the first meeting in four months today. The commission still has not set a date for reopening the casinos. The timing and conditions for resumption of gaming is unknown at this time. Time and will be based upon public health guidance and metrics and will proceed within the framework of Governor Pritzker's Restore Illinois plan. Guidelines for reopening were issued last week. They include social distancing, PPE, and daily health checks for workers, not included buffets or poker rooms. Joe Biden has released an eight-point plan to restart the U.S. economy in the wake of the outbreak. The Democratic presidential nominee is promising to dramatically expand testing for the virus, guarantee federal paid leave for all who get sick, and create a national task force to better track the spread of the disease. The nation's top military officer says it was a mistake for him to have been in Lafayette Square with President Trump last week. Army General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says his presence created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is speaking out against racism in America. The governor, who several years ago called for changing the names of streets named for Confederate generals, did not appear to feel the same way about an existing statue of Christopher Columbus in New York City. The statue was has come to represent and signify uh, appreciation for the Italian-American contribution to New York. Uh, so on that, for that reason, I support it. The governor is Italian-American. Your money on WGN. It's been a rough trading day. The Dow down 1,535 points so far today. The NASDAQ down 405 and the S&P 500 down 154. Standing by for a news conference from Mayor Lightfoot and others, I'm Steve Bertrand on Chicago's very own 720 WGN. It may not be stomach issues. For me, it's intense gas, or pain, or diarrhea, sometimes all at once, over and over. I spent years with the symptoms, but could never figure it out. No matter what I did, they never went away. So I decided to break it down for my doctor and get really specific about my symptoms. We discovered that exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI, may be the reason for my stomach issues. EPI is caused by my pancreas. It leads to diarrhea, gas, bloating, stomach pain, unexplained weight loss, and oily stools. The symptoms just don't go away. But EPI can show up with even one symptom. The good news, EPI is manageable. But to get to the right diagnosis, you have to break it down for your doctor and get specific about the severity of your symptoms. Visit IdentifyEPI.com to learn more and use the symptom checker to help change the conversation with your doctor. Brought to you by AbV. This is Steve Burton. This is Steve Bertrand in the WGN Newsroom. We will join the news conference now with Mayor Lightfoot. She's talking about something uh, she learned that was shocking to her, brought to her attention by Congressman Rush. I believe it regards police department activities. Let's listen in. Personally, thank you. And I commit to being your partner and making sure that we move forward together and use this moment as an opportunity to speak hard truths, to heal what is broken in our city, and that we join you on your lifelong fight 
for justice, and particularly for black and brown people in our city. We have a moment to make a huge difference. And we're going to seize this moment aggressively and move forward in partnership with you and the thousands of others across our city who are demanding justice and are seeing this moment as an opportunity to right the wrongs of the past. I'm going to ask Congressman Rush to um, come to the podium and describe uh, what happened, and then I will come back to the podium. Congressman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Langford. Let me begin by saying, some two years ago, I did not give this mayor the benefit of the doubt. Today I stand here without any doubt any doubt, any doubt in my heart, in my mind, and in my spirit that she is absolutely committed to the well-being of all Chicagoans, my none. I have watched her on local news, local commentaries. I have watched her on national news. As late as yesterday, I watched her on Morning Joe. And this mayor gets it. She speaks and provides a voice to all those who have no voice who live lives of mostly quiet desperation, but sometimes demonstrated desperation. She is, has a heart for the city, a heart for the black and brown communities, heart for those who own the margins of our society, a heart for those who are downtrodden, <clears throat> and a heart for those who are sinking the way out. This is the Earl of Lori Lightfoot, and I intend to do all that I can within all my capabilities to make this era of Laura Lightfoot the absolutely best era that this city has seen. She is, has been a reconciler of the many differences that she didn't create, but she has the capacity to resolve, the strength and encourage to correct. And I want to you to know that, again, I'm so proud of her leadership, her voice, her understanding. Two weeks ago, on a Sunday, I got a, on a Sunday evening, early Monday morning, I got a call that my campaign officers at 55th in South Wentworth had been burglarized, and that <clears throat> my district director had a videotape of eight or more police officers lounging in my office as what I assume looters were bringing in stores in this shopping center where my office is located at. We looked at the videotape and we saw eight or more police officers, including three white shirts, in repose, relaxing during these most difficult times. They had their feet up on the desk. One was 
asleep on my couch in my at my campaign office. One had his head down on the desk. One was on his cell phone. They even had the unmitigated gall to go and make coffee for themselves and to pop popcorn, my popcorn, in my microwave while looters were tearing apart businesses within their sight, within their reach. They were in a mode of, real, of relaxation and they did not care about what was happening to business people to the, this city. They didn't care. They absolutely didn't care. I talked to a caller, Alderman Dow, on last weekend, and asked her would she contact the mayor, tell the mayor that I have a video of these police officers in their miss or no conduct, lack of conduct, and I wanted to share that with her. I am so amazed, so thankful that it didn't take four hours since I talked to Old McDowell that the mayor was on the phone calling me, asking me, can I come down to City Hall? I told her that I, was, I had some obligation at my church. She said, well, what time do, do they in? I said, well, they end at, well, from, at 7 o'clock. Can you be here at 7.30? Last night at 7.30, I showed up here at City Hall. The mayor waiting for me. The police superintendent waiting for me. She wanted to view this videotape. I was absolutely, I am absolutely amazed at her response, how she takes it personally that these police officers, while on duty, in uniform, white shirts and mob, how they took such a lackadaisical attitude, a non-caring attitude, violating my personal space while looting was occurring all around them. They didn't care. But I stand here to salute our great mayor because although the policemen in that office in repose, in relaxation, didn't care, our mayor cared. She did care. And I'm so glad to be here this afternoon standing with a mayor who cares. Thank you. Congressman Bobby Rush there with uh, some profound allegations that Chicago police officers, including, um, it sounds like sergeants, were lounging in his office during the night of the uh, the violent Thank protests you, in the city of they Chicago. Incredibly powerful words, and let me lead by apologizing to you again. On behalf of our city, that you and your office were treated with such profound disrespect. That's a personal embarrassment to me. And I'm sorry that you and your ha staff even had to deal with this incredible indignity. I just spoke a moment ago about injustice. And it manifests itself in many obvious, but also subtle and insidious ways. Of course, when a black man dies in the street with a white police officer's knee on his neck, it is murder, but it's also profoundly unjust. And we can have no tolerance for that ever. And people are rightly outraged. 
but equally unacceptable as when there is looting and brazen criminal conduct, also unjust. And it really is the height of injustice when police are deployed, given a mission, and they fail to act. That, too, is injustice. Public safety cannot be a commodity that is only available to the wealthy and connected. Public safety must be a reality everywhere, everywhere, in every neighborhood of our city, period. When you swear an oath to serve and protect, you are a Chicago police officer, not a police officer for only certain neighborhoods and only at certain times. That is not how it is or will ever be in our city. Now, you've all seen me angry, unfortunately, a lot lately. I was and I still am angry at the murder of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of Ahmaud Arbery, and way too many others. And I was angry when looters hijacked righteous protesters and targeted black communities. I was angry and concerned when black and Latinx tension threatened to tear apart our city just at a time when we needed to stand united. And I'm angry today. As a black woman, we were often told, don't show your rage. Don't let them paint you as another angry black woman. Don't scold, don't curse, keep it together, be respectable and presentable. Now my life in this country has forced me to be angry and determined to be a fighter all my life. I have fought with every fiber of my being to survive in a world that was built to throw flaming roadblocks in our way as black people. And I am working every day to instill that fight and that determination in my black daughter and show her that even, yes, we have a responsibility to live our full and authentic lives, even in the face of these deeply ingrained and innately violent systems of racism. And if we're angry, let's not shrink from that, but let's use our anger to get results. And what I'm also feeling in this moment is incredible resolve. I do have a range of emotions as I stand here, but mostly, I'm done. We cannot go on like this anymore. Look, we don't paint all police officers with a broad brush. That would be wrong. And I spent a lot of time, and a lot of time being criticized for it, for praising our officers for their hard work, for their restraint, for de-escalation in the vast majority of cases over the recent weeks of unrest and protest. Those men and women are the heroes, and they have served the city honorably, and they represent the badge proudly. But the officers in this incident and others we've seen in the past weeks, Jack, if we can show like this, have demonstrated a total disregard for their colleagues, for the badge, and for those they were sworn to serve and protect. And these officers will be held accountable. This will be investigated thoroughly. That's why we have Chief Kono of IAD here and Sidney Roberts of the Office of Civilian, uh, Civilian Office of Police Accountability. This will be investigated thoroughly, and these officers and the supervisors will be identified, and they will be held to account. And I can tell you one thing for certain. Not one of these officers will be allowed to hide behind the badge and go on and act like 
nothing ever happened. Not anymore. Not in my city, not in your city. I was elected on a pledge to ensure transparency and accountability in all things, and particularly with the Chicago Police Department. We know we have a difficult and painful history in our city around delaying the release of videos depicting police misconduct. That is in part why we're showing you these images here today, less than 24 hours after I first laid eyes on them. What they show, regrettably, is that these individuals were lounging in a congressman's office, having a little hangout for themselves, while small businesses on the south side were looted and burned, while their colleagues were getting bottles thrown at their heads and doing everything they could to protect these communities. And perhaps what is most harmful about this is that for so many people on the South and the West Side, the actions of these officers, the deplorable lack of responsibility to do their job at a time when the city and their fellow officers needed them most, their conduct will confirm the perception that too many people on the South and the West Side were left to fend for themselves. That police don't care if black and brown communities were looted and burned. And while thousands of officers served honorably on that very difficult weekend and every day since, these individuals did indeed abandon their responsibilities and their obligation and their oath to serve and protect. We should all be disgusted. And we should all feel hurt and betrayed in this moment of all moments. But let's also not lose sight of the opportunity that this presents. This is a moment to be bold. And if we don't harness this moment to rethink what serving and protecting means, we will never do it. This moment presents us with an opportunity not to nibble around the edges, but to be bold. We're already working every day to implement the requirements of the consent decree, but that's not enough. But now, in this moment, it's time for us to fully implement the recommendations of the Police Accountability Task Force more than four years ago that have languished. Now is the moment to be honest about the ways in which the Fraternal Order of Police contract has been holding back the necessary change and reform that we must bring to make this police department fully accountable to the residents of this city. And now is the time to act on licensing for police officers once and for all. I'm here to tell you today that I have directed my legal team to do the research and to draft the legislation. I am ready, I am ready to work with the governor and our other great partners in Springfield to forge a change in state law to require licensing and certification of police officers. And I'm grateful for the attendance of Brad Cole, the leader of the Illinois Municipal League, and we will work together to make sure that we get this legislation passed. It's time, really, actually, it's way past time for this change in our state. And licensing is just one of several new measures that we must institute to make individual officers and departments far more accountable to the people. We have a long road and a hard road ahead. And none of these things is going to happen overnight. But I am grateful to have such a principled, focused partner in Superintendent Brown. He gets it. He's not afraid, and neither am I. And together, we want to be clear. You're not serving or protecting anybody when you're shouting a derogatory slur 
or gesture at them. You're not serving or protecting when you pull people by their, out of their cars, by their hair, and beat the daylights out of them in the street. You're not serving or protecting when you make movie popcorn and put up your feet and lounge while your fellow officers are down the street getting the hell beaten out of them and doing what they swore on earth to do. So today, yes, we are angry, but we're also resolved and we are committed. And we may not be perfect in all of our efforts from this moment forward, but we were seizing on this moment to finally make the changes that many thought were too politically sensitive or infeasible, or too big or too bold. The time for excuses is over. Our people are impatient, and rightfully so. I want to thank again the Congressman for his generosity, generosity of heart, for his lifelong journey to root out injustice, and I commit to being his partner in his quest. And with that, I'd like to ask Superintendent Brown to come to the podium. Superintendent Brown now will um, have some comments, but again, Mayor Lightfoot talking very emotionally about this ordeal and showing a still from the video of uh, one officer lying on a couch halfway, another with his head down, and uh, then the popcorn shown as well. And a personal apology to you for the actions of these officers from me. Let me start by sharing my comments with our commanders earlier this morning regarding this incident. I started out by saying what I truly believe is universally true in policing and beyond. That behavior reflects leadership, always. It's a hard truth to take when you're a leader, that you're responsible for the behavior of others. And we, we had an exchange about consequences for this type of behavior that we've seen, not just what happened at the Congressman's office, but the other behavior, you know, the officer giving the finger, homophobic slurs, excessive force. That behavior reflects our leadership. Officers asleep during a riot with supervisors in tow reflects our leadership. A few commanders I had to cut off because they began talking about us being too harsh. And when he said us, I said, you mean me being too harsh by relieving officers of their police powers. My rebuttal was it's time for you to stop talking. Our words are cheap when we defend officers for their misconduct. That the integrity of the Chicago Police Department is far more important than any individual's officer's friendship with you or family relationship with you. Our integrity to the residents of Chicago is our number one, two, and three priority that we are in a seminal moment, that we have to reveal our leadership. If that means strict discipline, that's what it means. We are determined. You know, when I was, I, I was raised by a Southern mother, a mother from the South, and even as a adult, my mother would look at me when I was doing something that didn't represent the family well. And she would want me to look at her to see her expression when she told me, I'm not playing with you. When I was misbehaving or doing something that represented another family. And so I share it with the commanders this morning. I'm a Norma Jean Brown son. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm not playing with you that I mean what I say when I say we're going to hold you accountable and that your behavior reflects my leadership and it reflects all of your leadership. Move, get out of the way, but we are going to uphold the nobility of this profession 
We're going to reveal our leadership, and we will be accountable to the Chicagoans that deserve a department that they can be proud of, that this conduct is not representative. But if it's not, let's do something about it. Let's just quit talking about they're good officers, that we did a good job, and that these are few bad apples. Let's now be the good cops who hold the bad cops accountable by rooting them out of this profession, period. No question mark, no gray area. This kind of conduct means if you sleep during a riot, what do you do on a regular shift when there's no riot? What, what are you doing when there's no crisis? And what makes you comfortable enough that supervisors won't hold you accountable? That means sergeants, lieutenants, commanders, chiefs, deputy chiefs need to step up or step out. I'm not playing. You're listening to Police Superintendent David Brown as he had a very frank meeting today with his command Good staff Anthony about Ricky, this. I'm the first deputy superintendent. Um, you notice I'm up here with no notes, uh, no script, because I don't need to script this. This is indefensible. What we saw there is absolutely indefensible. And I'll share with you a story. So I was out there, as was Chief Waller, as was the rest of the department. And the same time that these 13 officers were popping popcorn, taking a nap, relaxing inside this office, I was standing shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of other officers on State Street as we got pelted with rocks from rioters. I was hitting the leg. The officer standing next to me, part of my security detail, was hitting the head, hitting the helmet. Fortunately, he had his helmet on by the rocks. And that's occurring at the same time while these guys are inside having popcorn and making a pot of coffee. It is completely indefensible. And I'm the first one to jump up and, and defend officers. When, when I think they've done something right and they're improperly accused, I will defend them 100% of the time and they know it. This is indefensible. Um, there was a commander out there with me, the commander of the 24th district. She had lost her helmet when she was engaged with some of the protesters. And she stood there with no helmet, no face protection, as they were throwing rocks at her. And I finally had to tell her to go behind a protective barrier because the rocks were being, big rocks being thrown at us, being whizzed at us. And I had to pull her off the line and put her in a protected area. That's all going on the same time these 13 guys are making popcorn, taking a nap on a couch, and drinking a pot of coffee. So it is absolutely indefensible. I agree completely with the mayor and with the superintendent that it has to be addressed and it has to be addressed firmly. They didn't just let down the cit citizens of the city. They didn't just let down the people in that community, and they did. They also let down their fellow officers who are on the street fighting that battle to try to keep the city safe and to, to stop it from burning. We had 120 officers injured that night that they sat there. We had 167 vehicles damaged or completely destroyed the night these officers sat there, and countless businesses damaged and looted the same time that these officers sat there. So we're going to identify the officers involved, and there's going to be sure and swift discipline. Absolutely, there needs to be. And, um, and we're going to address it, and we're going to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Because as I said initially, it is absolutely indefensible. I invite Chief Waller. Who's first? I just want to say, you know, I've been a policeman for 34 years, and I've never been as embarrassed as I am right now. Uh, as I first said, uh, out there all day, all night, to the early morning, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with the officers, uh, all the things that we saw. I'm not even going to go through that. And it seems like as that, that tarnishes 
this incident tarnishes all those all those acts and those works that those officers did. Um, to say I'm angry, disgusted, it doesn't really. Um, I've never seen anything like this in my 34 years. Um, these officers did nothing to help their fellow officers. They did nothing to help these citizens. I know that mall. Uh, I've known the congressman. Uh, did nothing to help anyone in that in those instances. Stood by and just did nothing. Uh, the, their supervisors should be even held to a higher and will be held to a higher standard. They failed to live up to the standard, the integrity that we have as a policeman on that day, in that instance. We don't want to smear all the good work, but how can we not look at this and say this is something that must be widespread and we have to address it as the first said to continue to work hard every day uh is what we're going to continue to do we're not going to give up this fight uh, we're going to continue to build we're going to address this instance I identify these officers identify those supervisors and we're going to continue to get through these challenging uh times we cannot allow this attitude to exist within our department. We can't allow uh, all the good works that officers have done to be smeared by, by these, this incident, but we still have to address it. We must address this. It must be something that we continue to uh, look for and make sure that we address these, these type of incidents. I'm just going to close by saying I feel that these officers, uh, I've always been an uh, advocate for officers uh, for the good works that they do. This, this just cannot be uh, pushed aside. It cannot be handled gently. Um, and, and they let the entire city and the department down. So. You're listening live to a news conference after 13 officers were seen on videotape during That's the night question. of the violent protest Mayor, lounging you. in Can Congress and Bobby Rush's office. Of the details of the timetable, first mm -hmm. of all. Was the office burglarized? By someone else? Yes. And so, <clears throat> they so my, let me just, if I can recap for you. My understanding from con the congressman is the looting in that particular plaza started, uh, but I believe, much earlier in the day, um, late morning at the latest, and it carried on throughout the day. I believe that the videotape, and again, we're still going through the details, but the videotape, I believe, picks up at about uh, 1 a.m. And my understanding is that the officers were there four or five hours, possibly longer. And you'll see when you're able to, when we're able to get the video fully downloaded and processed, um, that they came in, in and out. It was a small core group initially, and then at its height, it was about 13 um, officers, three um, white shirts, supervisors, um, and 10 other officers. And so this was Sunday, May 31st. So this was actually, um, no, Monday, May, uh, June 1st. Ha okay, Monday, June 1st. Correct. And when you say white shirts, do you know yet what, what rank? Uh, we, we do not yet, um, but that work is ongoing. The congressman was generous enough with his um, uh, chief uh, to come down and show us the videotape uh, last evening. Um, after that, the work started uh, through um, uh, Chief uh, Kono to, uh, of IAD to start the process of identification, and that work is ongoing. Has anyone been identified? Um, there's been tentative identifications, but I don't want to go any further until we know for certain. But here's what I'll also say. Can we uh, put up the photo of the large group shot? You know who you are. You know what you did. Don't make us come find you. Come in, identify yourselves, but we will find you. What do you hope happens to these officers? Well, clearly, I believe that they tarnish the badge. Everything that the um, command staff members have said. You know, I asked last night when we were all assembled looking at these pictures and videos, is there any Thing that could even remotely be defensible here. As you heard, 
looting was going on, buildings were being truly taking a beating with rocks and bottles and pipes. And these guys were lounging in a congressman's office. Let's not lose sight of that. The utter contempt and disrespect on so many levels is almost hard to fathom. When Congressman Rush first called me and we spoke, and he started describing what we then saw, I had to stop and ask him a couple times if what he said was correct. Because it's almost inconceivable in the middle of what was going on that late night and into the early morning hours, where looting continued till, uh, till Monday morning, and having started Saturday night. It's inconceivable. Look at this guy, sleeping on a congressman's couch, popping popcorn. You can see one of the popcorn bags right there in the image. It's should just, they be fired? <clears throat> I believe that we should take the strongest possible action. We don't know all the details, it's still very much young, but the strongest possible action that we can take should be taken. The and particularly, me. particularly with the supervisors. You know, as Superintendent asked the question, which is appropriate, these officers clearly felt like they were untouchable that there would be no accountability. And why not when the bosses, the white shirts, are in the room with them? We got a, we got a problem that we have to solve with all degree of urgency. Do you know what district the officers are from? We don't at this point. Um, as you know, um, because of what was going on in the south and the west sides that Sunday, officers were pulled from all over the city and then deployed to the south and the west side. So the work of identifying them through those assignment sheets, through um, the GPS on vehicles, that work is ongoing. Could they face a crime themselves? It's a question that we're asking, and we'll certainly make sure that this is um, given scrutiny um, by the state's attorney and by the U.S. attorney. Alderman Dell, is this your ward as well? Could we hear from you about this? I just wonder what the residents, when mm -hmm. folks see this, what will folks, what will people in your community, what will they say? Well, first I want to thank uh, Congressman Rush for reaching out to me and, and giving me the call and sharing the tape with the mayor. I definitely thank the mayor for her swift action on, on our behalf. Um, this was a total dereliction of their duty. And uh, with the looting that occurred in this mall, literally almost every store was looted from health centers to credit unions uh, to retail stores to, lick, to a liquor store. Um, we are appalled when we see this because our expectation is that the police are there to serve and protect. And in this case, sitting on your butt, eating popcorn, drinking coffee, and laying around uh, doesn't do the community any good. Alderman Telfella, are you here as well to speak out on, the, on what has happened? Are you, uh, I, I should know this, whether you are uh, the police and fire uh, chairman, I'm not quite sure, okay. but I want, Yes, I just wondered if you wanted to weigh in as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for inviting me to the uh, press conference here, as well as uh, Superintendent um, Mayor and uh, the Superintendent's command staff. Um, I agree with every single word that was said today. Uh, if I could just take a quick second. Um, I was not going to speak, uh, but this is something that I keep on my phone, especially lately because it's something that meant a lot to me. It says the motto, we serve and protect, states the essential purpose of the Chicago Police Department. The department, the department serves the citizens of the city of Chicago by performing the law enforcement function in a professional manner. And it is to these citizens that it is ultimately responsible. That means a lot to a 
thousands of police officers that we have on the Chicago Police Department. Unfortunately, the 13 that you see in front of you on these video monitors, this motto of we serve and protect means nothing, absolutely nothing to them. Those that have honorably served this department in the past and those that will serve it in the future needs to make sure that this is in, embedded in their thoughts every single day that they walk outside the door to serve this great city. They owe a responsibility and an obligation, not only to the officers that they serve with, not only to their families that they're working very hard for, but they owe that responsibility to the citizens first in the city of Chicago, to the business owners that set up their shops in the city of Chicago, to the seniors that reside in the city of Chicago, because we rely on them. We rely on just service. And when we can't get it, this is what happens. The mayor didn't mention that there were deaths, quite a few deaths That's right. over the weekend. And I would hate to see that a death occurred in that area where these officers felt it was more important for them to take a nap, that it was more important for them to eat a bag of popcorn, or that it was more important for them to get a cup of coffee. Again, I say that this responsibility of performing their duties in a professional manner is their first priority as a police officer. I said this morning, and I'll, I'll be very brief, I said this morning that since the 1830s, the concept of policing and the principles of policing have never changed. The purpose of a police department in our society is still the same. In the hundreds of years that police departments have served the cities throughout this country and throughout the world, that concept remains untrained. It's the techniques that's being used to perform those, uh, those principal functions that is what's changed over the years. We gotta get back. Our police department has to get back to understanding what the core principles of policing means. And so I stand with the mayor and the superintendent and his command staff in making sure that swift dif um, the discipline is swift in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, was there any delay? I know you didn't see this until yesterday, but because this happened, uh, why so many days before we're all aware now of this? Well, I'll, I'll let the, the congressman speak to that, but um, I think what happened is they were simply trying to take stock. Um, campaign office, my understanding is it had been shut down after the primary. Um, his congressman staff had dutifully been out there at multiple times that day, saw that it was broken up, uh, broken into, but of course never would have conceived what they ended up seeing. And then when they did look at the video and saw the looters, but then saw what we now know, that's when um, they decided to act. But I, I think it was just everybody has felt incredibly overwhelmed over these last couple of weeks, Congressman. Mayor, let me just say, uh, I didn't want to share this with this kind of personal, but when that very name. Day. I was called to the University of Chicago Hospital. My younger, youngest sister, Judy, passed that very day. And so my family and I had to take some time to process all of that. That was the priority for my family and for myself. So that is the primary reason that I hesitated when they laid the sharing this video with the mayor. But notwithstanding the they laid within a matter of a couple She swung into action. 
And I just want to tell all the citizens of this great city, line up behind this mayor. Get behind our mayor. She has the right stuff. She will make a difference in this city. And she needs our absolute commitment to work with her to right the tremendous wrongs that have existed in this city for decades. With the police department in the forefront of that, let's get behind this courageous dedicated, committed mayor who can bring us to a higher level and make Chicago really, instead of being the laughing stock of the nation, she can make this city the wonder of the world. And I believe in her. Thank you, Congressman. Mayor, do you, people, uh, several questions that have been given to me by other reporters. Do you believe it will be easy or difficult to get the state uh, to license police officers through the legislature? Well, it's not going to be easy. Um, I expect a significant uh, amount of opposition um, from police unions. But I think we're at a moment where the things that we felt like were impossible, that politically just weren't feasible. I think we're in a moment where we have the opportunity to make this happen. And look, even when it may be difficult, if it's right and righteous, we must act. And this is right. And I think there's far more that we will do. You know, my staff will blanch when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the things that continuously troubles me is thinking about John Burge. John Burge was fired by the police board in 1993. John Burge caused immeasurable harm to so many people. Even if you calculated the dollars, the city's probably spent about $200 million and counting on misconduct cases related to John George and his midnight crew. He was prosecuted and found guilty by Pat Fitzgerald's U.S. Attorney's Office and went to federal prison. He got out of prison and he lived a number of years thereafter. And every minute he enjoyed his police pension. Dollars from the CARES Act is going for violence prevention. Mm -hmm. Can you Um, local organizations uh, to aid in uh, violence prevention. Uh, the B Block Club is asking about the budget as well. Chicago's budget, 40% goes to policing. Mm -hmm. Do you plan on reducing that number? Well, look, th this, this issue of defunding the police, when I hear that, what I hear is people rightfully offended by the fact that we have not invested enough and communities. And I've been very clear about this. I ran on this. I like to think I got elected because I ran on this. We have to bring resources and investments to neighborhoods and communities that have been without an ounce of investment for decades. And I won't go on and recount the things that we've already done, but I am committed to making sure that we change that history so that we are investing and in answering the cry and the plea of this moment and i'm committed to doing that i don't believe that we can survive as a city without making these kinds of critical investments i also know and one of the um, folks said it i think it was alderman talio Ferro, on that same sunday where the looting was happening, 17 people were murdered in our city. 
17 people. I know that we have open air drug markets where they're unbelievably lucrative, $30,000 in cash a day, and they will shoot and kill anybody to keep that territory. We need to have this discussion, but we need to have it in the full context and understanding of the time that we are in. Could you react, as well as the superintendent, would you both react to the fraternal order of police president saying that he could expel members who kneel in solidarity with protesters while in uniform? You know what? Um, there will be a reckoning for the FOP, and I think that moment is now, and that's what I'll say about that. Superintendent, superintendent would you weigh in as well? <clears throat> It's just hard to take those kinds of comments uh, serious uh, as we deal with um, COVID environment, historically high violent crime, and now misconduct uh, as relates to civil unrest. H how does that bubble up to the most important thing to comment on? It it it's, it's, it's not. You're listening to live coverage of an ex explosive, really, news conference from Mayor Lightfoot, Superintendent Brown, and others, Congressman Bobby Rush, talking about surveillance video of the Rush campaign office during the looting that showed 13 Chicago police officers, uh, three of them white shirts, as they were referred to, or supervisors, spending, as uh, I understood it, four or five hours coming in and out of the Congressman burgled campaign office, some of them sleeping. There were pictures of that, a couple of them appearing to nod off. Uh, also using Boy, the Congressman's pictures. coffee uh, pot to make coffee and uh, pop some popcorn as well. You know, uh, those pictures, uh, we just have to describe them. They are as advertised. And this is, uh, it's so sad to see. They're, they're sitting there, they're napping, they're lounging in that office while literally the city burned. Rioters were looting, you had 18 murders that day. So much going on there. You heard the superintendent say officers slept while the city burned during a riot. And you just wonder um, it, that that is the headline. And, and, it, and it's sad. And I think they brought so much shame to the department. It's it's a time when, you know, you talk about this being a moment in time for this city, you know, a tipping point now more than ever when police reform is front and center. And these officers offered basically a closing argument in the case about why we need reforms. But I just feel as if all the good men and women of the CPD who are out there getting bottles to their heads and getting concrete and bricks thrown at them, how they must feel right now. How do you feel? Let's take your calls after we're going to break for the news um, and take your calls on this. And uh, we do want to hear, oh, it's Ryan Burrow in the newsroom at the top of the hour. We'll be getting to him in a second. But we want to hear from you on this, what you just heard. It sadly lived up to its billing as a shocking discovery about some Chicago police officers at that moment in time. Uh, the mayor very emotional at times as well there. She talked about licensing and that the legislation's going through. And basically, uh, the way I understand it, if that licensing goes through, you have to get a license to, in order to be a police officer in Chicago police, that if that license gets yanked, you're out. And so there's a new governing body. It's a new day, as one officer texted me while that was going on, a new day for Chicago police. We want to get your reaction on this, hear what you have to say about it. Um, so many layers there, so many things to sort of, uh, you know, talk about, as um, that is not what I expected to be at all um, for our city at this period of time. I thought we were on track to be moving forward, and that is not at all the look we needed right now. Um, those officers have been asked to come forward turn themselves in. We'll see what happens. We'll talk about it uh, after the news here at the top of the hour on WGN. Serving the great Midwest from Chicago, this is WGN at AM 720 on your radio and on smart devices anywhere just by saying play WGN radio on TuneIn. WGN Chicago A Nexstar Media Group station. Sunny skies at 2 o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Burrow. The news sponsored by LindholmRoofing.com. Allegation Chicago police officers broke into a campaign office of Congressman Bobby Rush. Stocks tumbling today. First, let's get a look at WGN traffic. Lauren Lapka. An accident on I-80-94 West is blocking the left lane at Torrance. Traffic is heavy from Indianapolis. No issues on the Edens. Inbound Kennedy is a bit backed up from Fullerton. It's 25 minutes from O'Hare. A disabled vehicle inbound on the Eisenhower is in the left lane near Harlem. 
Salem. It's a half hour from 390. Stevenson looking good. I-55 North is congested between Lorenzo and Blodgett because of road work. And outbound Dan Ryan is stop and go from Garfield. It's 25 minutes to 95th. Lauren Lapka, WGN Traffic Central. The forecast from the WGN Chicago Weather Center. It's going to be comfortable here for the rest of today. A little breezy. West winds gusting up to 30 miles per hour. Temperatures topping out in the upper 70s to lower 80s. A little late day cloud cover could lead to a stray sprinkle or two. But then we clear things right back out for tonight as we drop into the lower 60s. Plenty of sunshine on our Friday. Highs in the mid-70s and then upper 60s at the lakefront. But look for those temperatures to fall late in the day as north-northeast winds start to become breezy, gusting upwards to 25 miles per hour. That's just a precursor to a much cooler weekend. Despite mostly sunny skies on Saturday, temperatures only make their way into the upper 60s inland, it's like lower 60s lakeside. On Sunday, mostly sunny in the afternoon, highs in the lower 70s, mid-60s at the lake. And then Monday, back to work with mostly sunny skies. Highs in the upper 70s inland, closer to 70 by the lake front there. And then on Tuesday, we become partly cloudy in the afternoon. Can't rule out a stray shower, but temperatures climb. Highs in the mid-80s inland, upper 70s lakeside. From the WGM Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Mike Jansen. You heard just moments ago some breaking news, developing story here in the city of Chicago while businesses were being looted on the south side back on June. June 1st, new surveillance video shows 13 Chicago police officers lounging in Congressman Bobby Rush's office. Some of those officers sleeping, making coffee, and popping popcorn in the microwave. Mayor Lightfoot apologizing to the city. When you swear an oath to serve and protect, you are a Chicago police officer. Not a police officer for only certain neighborhoods and only at certain times. That is not how it is or will ever be in our city. Mayor Lightfoot says the incident will be thoroughly investigated and for all of the officers, they will step forward or need to step forward or they will be found, they will be held accountable. Investor concerns of a second wave of coronavirus infection sent stocks plummeting today. Investors who had been betting that the reopening economy would steadily improve are now becoming more concerned about a surge in coronavirus cases in areas that have reopened. Fears of setbacks as well as a reality check from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell saying Wednesday of the downturn that we're in this for the long haul, forcing investors to reassess more optimistic assumptions about the economy. Dave Packer, ABC News. The Dow right now down 6%, down about 1,600 points. I'll give you a full report coming up. Another 1.5 million Americans filing new unemployment claims last week in Illinois. There were nearly 45,000 residents who filed new unemployment claims in the week ending June 6th. That's about 1,500 fewer claims than filed the week prior. Outside the Senate Judiciary Committee business meeting Thursday, Senate Democrats voicing their support for moves by the Senate to rename military bases based after Confederate generals generals to remove Confederate statues from the Capitol. Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois says it's about time. I think this this part of the reckoning that's long overdue. As for renaming the bases, the president, President Trump, says he opposes efforts to do that. Doctors at Northwestern Medicine announcing they successfully completed what they believe to be the first ever double lung transplant on a COVID-19 patient. After spending six weeks on a ventilator, the patient's a woman in her 20s was deemed to have irreversible damage to her lungs, so doctors performed surgery on her late last week. Dr. Ankit Bharat is surgical director at the Northwestern Medicine Lung Transplant Program. He says she's now in stable condition and is expected to make a full recovery. Yesterday she smiled and told me just one sentence. She said, Doc, thank you for not giving up on me. As healthcare providers, there's nothing more gratifying to hear. Before they could perform the surgery, they needed to make sure that her Lungs were cleared of COVID-19. There's an all-star lineup scheduled for Chicago Public Schools virtual high school graduation this weekend. Not only will Oprah give the keynote address and hip-hop artist Common will deliver an opening dedication. Chicago athletes, including the Cubs Chris Bryant and Kyle Schwarber, the White Sox Tim Anderson, and the Blackhawks Patrick Kane will all be part of the festivities. There will be an after party featuring DJ Khalid, Andy Grammer, and Thomas Red, among others. The commencement begins Sunday at 1 o'clock. Tim Gordon, WGN News. Former parents and students at Palatine High School are calling for the firing of a social studies teacher after an alleged racist post on social media. Steve Gordon says the teacher was suspended last year after she swore at his son. So that we're going to learn about the Constitution and it just set her off and uh, 
you know, she basically said, if you want to learn about the blank constitution, you could learn about the blank constitution. Gordon and others plan to attend a virtual school board meeting next week over the incident. The district says proper action will be taken following an investigation. Well, we told you about stocks not looking good today. Right now, the Dow down 1,604 points, just under 6%. The S&P 500 is down 167 points, and the NASDAQ down 462. We've got 77 degrees in Aurora. It's 81 degrees in Joliet, 79 degrees at Midway, 77 at O'Hare, and 77 degrees along Chicago's lakefront. I'm Ryan Burrow on Chicago's very own 720 WGN. Gear up for summer with a little help from Blaine's Farm and Fleet. We have all the supplies you need to get your animals in tip-top shape. Stock up on select bags of Safe Choice Equine Feet, now $2 off. Keep your barn cool this summer with a 24-inch portable tilt fan, on sale $119.99. Keep your horses feeling their best with the right supplements. AgriMaster's line of Weight Booster, Flex Aid, Senior Combo, and Hoof Supplement will keep them moving along. Now $4 off. And stock up on Lincoln Size All Baylor Twine. Available in 9,000 or 16,000 foot rolls. Your choice, $39.99. Plus, save on these great doorbuster deals. Farm and Fleet 15W40 Diesel Oil. A 5-gallon pail, just $34.99. And Farm and Fleet 40-pound bags of original cat food, now $2 off. That's genuine value from Blaine's Farm and Fleet. June is National Dairy Month. All of us at Blaine's Farm and Fleet would like to salute Midwest dairy farmers and their families and say thank you. seven here on WGN. Boy, that wasn't what I thought it would be. Anna Devlantis here with you this afternoon. Let us know what you, if you just listened to that news conference with the mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, Superintendent David Brown with CPD and Congressman Bobby Rush. Um, just they said it would be a shocking uh, discovery about what some police officers were up to during that very, very uh, difficult, painful, uh, violent day couple weekends ago when the city was burning there were people looting there was aggressiveness every during that time 13 officers including white shirts the supervisors like sergeants and lieutenant types lounged on sofas in congressman bobby rush's office they popped popcorn made coffee and if you look at the pictures it looks like they don't have a care in the world Very difficult to hear, very difficult images to see. It's it's a slap in the face to the city and a slap in the face to Chicago police officers as well. If you think about that, and it was pointed out during that news conference that you think about what their fellow officers were doing at that time, getting bottles thrown at them, bricks thrown at them. They were, a couple of them being dragged through the streets and facing off with the kind of chaos that... Um, I don't care what training you have. I don't know how you get prepared for that. In meantime, 18 people died in that period of time also. How close were they to that? What was their assignment? What were they doing? What could they possibly have been thinking as they have police radios too? They knew what was happening in the city. Mayor was asked, will they be fired? Uh, she didn't do what she had done before and, and kind of spoke, spoke from the heart when she was asked about the officers with the middle fingers, uh, with the middle fingers up. And she had said he should be fired. This time she said the strongest possible action. Uh, you know, uh, it's hard for them to do their job now, I would say. They're, they're asking them to come forward. They're asking them, don't let us come find you. Come forward and just, you know, basically tell us what what, what were you thinking there? 312-981-7200. Think about the shame that this brings to the police department at exactly this time when, you know, everything that officers are doing is being questioned and challenged and scrutinized and some of that for good reason some of it for not so good reason and then you see this you see what we just saw trying to understand the reasons for this let us know your thoughts 312-981-7200 we did get a text that defended the officer this is the one i only one i saw there so far but keep them coming and also call us join into the conversation Our number is 312-981-7200. Here's that text. We need to hear both sides of the story before we make judgment. That could have been a command post with the supervisors being present. And I believe union workers get a lunch and breaks. So uh, careful judging. I don't know if that's the case. Let's uh, talk to Sergeant Pete. He certainly was paying attention to this news conference. Ever heard anything like this, Sergeant Pete? Boy, this was a shocker. Mm -hmm. Um, 
she was, I've known her over 25 years. I, I, she was very controlled and mad. And for Riccio to step up, I've known him a long time, and he's a policeman's policeman. For him to step up and say how disgusted he was, uh, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, as it being a command post, if it is a command post, you know, you would rotate people in and out. Um, you don't know if they were ordered to stay there, if they were ordered to stand down, you know, if their bosses told them, you know, we were keeping you in abeyance in case we need you for something else. You know, there's for something a, a else. Pete, the, 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 the city was burning at that moment. I know there's a riot. There's a I, riot. I there's there are people riot. dying. There, there were so many calls for service that we've heard personally from people who called into this radio show and told us, my husband was unconscious, one woman told me, and we couldn't get through. There were so many things happening across the city. To see that, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's beyond sad. It's, it's shameful. Yeah. Well, that woman uh, commander that Riccio was talking about, I, I, I know her, and they knocked her helmet off. I don't know. I mean, uh, unless they come up with some really spectacular uh, report writing and wording, I, I don't know. I think, though, that the blue shirts and then you get to the supervisors, the accountability for the supervisors is much more than for the people in the blue shirts. If the supervisors took no actions and there's looting and rioting and people, like you said, get 18 people dead, and, they, you know, why they would pick a congressman's office to lounge in, that's beside the point. And then eat his popcorn and drink his coffee. I mean, that's And look like bizarre. they didn't have a care in the world as they had their, yeah, they had their police. Sleeping on duty, radios. you can't do that. Yeah, you can't sleep on duty.